the one I did do it last week. Take a moment and pray with me, please. Lord, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto you. Fill my lungs with your breath, my mouth with your message, the message you want heard this day. I ask all things in the precious, holy, and risen name of Jesus. Amen. 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 So, questions. Did any of you have one of those children that asked a thousand questions? Mm -hmm. But then when you answered them, they asked a thousand more questions? I have one grandchild. The one grandchild I have who asks millions of questions. And some questions that are asked just make us shake our head, right? You, you wonder where they come from. So there's a lot of questions that maybe are considered unanswerable. So I'm not going to ask for your opinion on these questions. Just hear me through and you'll, you'll, you'll see how it ties in here. So some of the questions that I found on the internet that I thought were kind of funny were, why do banks charge insufficient funds when you don't have the money in your account in the first place? If everything in the universe, including atoms and particles, stop moving, does time stop? Or does time continue even if everything else stops? Why do we wait until nighttime to call it a day? Why does it not stop? When does it stop being partly cloudy and become partly sunny? Which baby is the cutest baby born ever? And this one I like. Can you cry underwater? <laughs> How can something be both new and improved? Because if it's new, what are you improving on? For some very interesting questions, try Googling it. There are some interesting ones out there. But, but seriously, these questions really are answerable, even though they may say they're not such as the cutest baby ever born? Okay, every mom wants the answer. My baby, <laughs> right? But that shows us how answers can be subjective. Answering questions can be fun. Answering questions can be difficult. They can be funny. They can be serious. Questions and answers can be fun if you're playing trivia, family feud, it's all about the answers you give. In escape rooms, anybody ever done an escape room? Did you get out? Yeah? Okay. I haven't done it because I'm not good at that kind of stuff, but you got to figure out clues or come up with answers. Questions can also be left unanswered. How many of us have ever been asked a question you really don't want to answer? <laughs> Probably all our husbands say, yes, yeah, sorry, husbands, but I'm sure that's their answer. So in today's reading, Pilate asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answers with a question. Do you ask this of your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answers with two questions. I am a Jew, am I not? And what have you done? So are you a king? So we have five questions asked in today's reading. And the final verse, when asked a second time, are you the king of Jews? You say, I am a king. Then he explains this. For this I was born. This is Jesus talking. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. You see, my guess is that Jesus didn't answer a yes or a no to these questions is because he knew that Pilate wasn't ready for that answer. He wasn't really looking for the truth. Pilate was looking for what maybe he thought was true, but he was looking for an answer that would prevent riots in the street or maybe a visit from the governor at that time. I'm not here to get all philosophical about these questions. Jesus was not trying to get Pilate into a conversation about Greek philosophy. Jesus was not referring to the truth of the philosophers, but the truth of and about God. Jesus knew that Pilate wasn't ready to hear the truth 
about God. So he doesn't respond to Pilate's final question, what is truth? Some have suggested that perspective is truth. The basis for their approach is of, of a personal opinion. We can all be like the men and women who participated in a study about their weight. There is a vast difference between truth and perception of truth. In a survey in American Health Magazine, it was learned that 40% of overweight men thought they looked just fine and that their weight was just right for them. In contrast, 25% of women who were not overweight felt that they needed to lose weight to achieve their desired healthy body weight. Both groups are operating under the perception of truth rather than truth itself. Such thinking can lead to some pretty erroneous behavior. But what happens when your truth doesn't agree with my truth? I would say a lot of arguments start because I want to prove to you that my truth is right and you want to prove to me that your truth is right. I think I can clearly explain that by setting the thermostat in the house. I have one truth on what that thermostat should be set at. My husband has a totally different truth on what that thermostat should be set at. So we have thermostat wars at my house. Pilate's final question, what is truth? Jesus' reluctance to answer a question about truth I'm going to answer today, and many other pastors will too, because when you read the Bible, you will find where Jesus really does answer those questions. Truth is that God loves us. Truth is that God wants us to be reconciled to him. Truth is that believing in Jesus is the way to salvation. Truth is that God's kingdom is not like earthly kingdoms. Truth is that we should love God and our neighbors as ourselves. God's word is truth. And of course, Jesus says the way, the truth, and the life is through him. So of course the question what is truth is not impossible to answer. Jesus says that everyone who belongs to him listens to his voice. That is repeated in John 10, where he talked about being the good shepherd. And he says in verse 3, the sheep hear his voice. The sheep will follow him because they know his voice. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. And finally, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Therefore, to belong to the truth, to listen to Jesus' voice, is to be a member of the flock over which Jesus is the shepherd. Now, back in Jesus' day, the word shepherd was frequently used as a metaphor for king. <laughs> So there's our connection between our reading today and Christ the King Sunday. What we are to remember of Jesus, of God being King of our lives, all of our lives. So where in our culture today do we see examples of belonging to the truth? Remember, belonging to the truth is listening to Jesus' voice. And there are lots of things right here at Good Shepherd that show how we, as a congregation, listen to his voice. We listen to his voice when we do ministry. We listen to his voice when you do 80, how many, Nicole, 88? 88 Thanksgiving bags. 88 families are able to eat on Thanksgiving because this church listened listens to the voice of Jesus Christ. And that's only one small part of the ministry that's done here. The peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, the, the prayer shawls, it could go on and on.
but you're listening to the truth. You're listening to the voice of Jesus. Now the harder part, because that's all the fun part, the easy part, right? The harder part is what happens in the times that we don't listen to Jesus' voice and what a difference that makes. When we don't show love for each other, we're not listening to Jesus' voice. We're not listening when we don't repent of our sins. We're not listening when we don't pray for our enemies. When we're not involved in making disciples of Jesus Christ, we are not listening to him. When we do not pray, meaning we have no time for a conversation with him, how can we be listening? When we for do not forgive each other, when we're consumed with being materially and financially successful, we're not listening to Jesus. When we express anger and verbal abuse, we are not listening. When we seek revenge on those who have wronged us, when we seek favor and applause of the public, when we do things for others' approval and not the approval of Christ, we are not listening. When we're consumed with worry and anxiety, we're not listening because Jesus tells us we don't need to do that. When we judge others. See, I told you, the, the do not listen to Jesus is harder to hear than when we do listen to Jesus. But you can see how much hurt we cause and we can feel when we don't listen to the truth compared to all the good that happens all the lives that are blessed, all the people who can eat, who can be warm when we do listen. When we turn off Jesus, we turn off the truth. When we turn off the truth, we turn off from living a meaningful life. I know many of us are really busy this week with Thanksgiving preparations, family gatherings, there's lots of food, there'll be lots of laughs, and honestly, there will be lots of dishes. For my family, we spend our time, the first thing we usually do, and I'm sure you do as well, what are you thankful for? And we're thankful, especially this year, to be able to gather, right? Because we remember when we couldn't even gather as families for a holiday celebration. We're thankful for health, we're thankful for recovery. We can be thankful for so many things. And, and this year, I know my grandchildren are thankful to be in school. I know my daughters are thankful that their kids are in school. We are thankful also for all our stuff. Our houses, cars, clothes, all our belongings. I am thankful this year, it's my first year here at Good Shepherd for Thanksgiving, and I am thankful to be here with each of you. I am thankful for God, for his love, for his patience, for his guidance, for his patience. I always repeat that one twice. You see, we teach our children from the very beginning, when somebody gives you something you're supposed to say, thank you. One of the first things we teach our children when they can talk, right? Say thank you, say thank you. We even do that, they get a Halloween treat. They gotta stop and say thank you. We teach our children good manners. Do we thank God only for his provision? Which is basically, are we just having good manners? I'm sure this is familiar to everyone here. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You see, David, the writer of Psalm 23, reminds us of all God has provided for us. Right, Just in that short verse, he provides the green pastures for us. He leads us. He protects us. All the things that he provides for us. But we have to be thankful for more than just the provisions. Because then it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy ride and thy staff, they comfort me. 
Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Good manners teach us to thank God for all the things that we can see. David is saying that even though, even though I have to sit at a table with enemies, even though maybe my life didn't turn out quite the way I wanted it to, even though I'm having a really hard time right now, even though maybe my enemy is finances, maybe I don't know how I'm going to put food on the table this week, even though someone in my family has an addiction, even though perhaps I suffer from loneliness or confusion, even though my enemies are strong and determined, that we are to thank God for his presence, even though. Keep your eyes focused and your heart filled with the love of God. Holidays can be very difficult for many people for many reasons. And today I just want you to hear and go home with the assurance that because life is so uncertain, you don't know what the next minute will bring. But the God of our life, our shepherd, offers us eternal comfort. You know, even though really hit me this week. You see, when I share a message, I'm not only preaching with you or to you, but I'm preaching to myself. Because my daughter got sick this week and I had to make a quick trip to North Jersey at six o'clock in the morning. And I just kept saying, you know, my first thought is, why did this happen yet again for this daughter? And I kept saying, no, even though God, this is happening, I am thankful for your presence. I'm thankful that I had a car that I could drive, that I had money to put gas in my car so that I could get there. Even though it was stressful, even though it was inconvenient, God was with us. Even though I had to get up at 5 o'clock yesterday morning and get on the parkway so I could be in Ocean City on time, even though that wasn't my plan for this week, <laughs> Because you know I'm busy. Even though God was with me, he kept me safe. He has protected my daughter. She will be fine. I just got a text. She will have surgery tomorrow morning. She will be fine. She'll be home by Tuesday. Life will hopefully resume to whatever our normal is going to be. But even though no one expects an emergency surgery Thanksgiving week, God is there. There was medical care available to her. There is a caring nurses and staff to take care of her and love her when we can't be with her. You see, even though our lives are difficult and complicated, God is always, always with us, protecting us and loving us, even when life doesn't turn out the way we want it to or the way we think it should. Psalm 23's last verse says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. All the days. So even when I, my perception is that I'm having a bad day, goodness and mercy are with me because I have Jesus Christ. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord, not just today, but forever. Forever. God, the perfect shepherd, promises, promises you goodness and mercy to guide and protect you so that we can have his house to live in forever. So I encourage you that if you are going through an even though difficult time, to remember all, and just remember even though, even though, two words, even though, and fill in the rest. Even though this really is hard, God is with me. Amen, church? Amen. Remember all the promises that God has made you. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. God loves us at all times. Goodness and mercy are mine. Thanks be to God. 
And I want to end with this with this story I found on the internet. And it says that Lou Wallace, the governor of New Mexico, was writing a book against Jesus Christ. And in the process was converted to Christianity. You see, he told a friend how it happened. He says, I have always been agnostic and denied Christianity. So Wallace said, Robert C. Ingersoll, a famous agnostic, was one of his most intimate friends. And he once said, see here, you're a very learned man, and you're a thinker. So why don't you write a book? Why don't you gather material? Why don't you write a book to prove all the false things concerning Jesus Christ that people keep saying? That no such man could have ever lived, much less the author of teachings found in the New Testament. Such a book would make you famous. You could make a lot of money. It would be a masterpiece in a way of putting an end to all this foolishness of Christ. So Wallace went home, told his wife about his project, and she was not happy. She happened to be a United Methodist and did not like this idea one bit. But Wallace began to collect material from libraries all over the world, covering the period in which Jesus Christ, they say, lived. Now this took years all this research, and then he started writing. He was four chapters into the book, and he says when it became clear to him that Jesus Christ was just as real as he was, the conversion, the conviction became a certainty. I know that Jesus Christ had lived because of the facts connected to the period in which he lived. So he asked himself candidly, if this was a real person, was he not then also the Son of God and the Savior of the world? Gradually, Wallace realized that since Jesus Christ was a real person, that he was who he claimed to be. He says, I fell on my knees to pray, and for the first time in my life, I asked God to reveal himself to me, to forgive my sins and to help me become a follower of Christ. Toward morning, the light broke into my soul. I went into the bedroom and I woke my wife and I told her that I had received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If you haven't gotten to that point in your life, I urge you to do it today. Now, you don't know what the next minute of your life will bring. Jesus offers you that gift. Enjoy it, receive it, and be thankful, not just for his provisions, but for his presence in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you take a moment and join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.